Um, okay, well, um, I did prepare a case study that I think is really interesting. Do you guys have anything you wanted to bring to the table? I actually do. So I have to tell you, she's the first person I've seen. She has a very high BMI. In all standards, she would be obese. So I have to tell you, I've never really trained someone that's like 80, 90 pounds overweight. She's extremely valgus. But, and then you put 80 pounds on that and you understand what's happening in the knee joint, right? And the hips. I don't even know how to start with her abdominals. Like I don't, I'm kind of addressing the pain situation first, which is she just wants to walk and be out of pain. So that's what I'm doing, but I'm happy to hear anything you have to say. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for bringing that up. So I think a really important, I think a really important topic is weight. And while it's a sensitive topic, um, in, in an orthopedic sense, so somebody who's in pain um, and mechanically and orthopedically in the body, there's a lot of research that shows, especially with knees, and uh, especially with knees is where I've seen the research and, and lower back, I have to say, is that um, if the person, they have studies that actually show people with arthritic knees and knee pain, if they lose weight and come to a normal weight, who are overweight or obese, mm -hmm. if they come to a normal weight, the knee pain goes away. And so there is a very direct correlation between body weight and joint pain in the knees specifically and in the lower back. And I would have to look up and see what there is on the hip, but I would assume it's also there for the hip, the research. So it's not, you're not misspeaking um, and you're not judging if you're, if the conversation comes up around weight. And so usually I do broach the topic in a very loving, sensitive way and just say, you know, I, I believe um, here's the options. Here's, I just want you to know, or do you know that extra body weight can put a lot of pressure on the joints mm. and help and cause issues with the joints? Um, and potentially if there was less body weight on the joints, they would hurt less. Um, and I try and say something like that to that effect that's very sensitive, very knowing that it's really hard to lose weight. It's not something that's easy. And to your point, if you can't walk, you can't lose weight. I mean, the, people get into this pain cycle where they get more painful, they stop moving, they gain more weight, right? It really is this terrible cycle that we get stuck in. So I think yeah. working with the legs, increasing strength, yeah. increasing range of motion, working on alignment of the lower limbs is very key okay. and that so that would be the first point the second point to your point about strengthening uh somebody who's very overweight so here's your normal tactics and your normal feel this poke here touch this really don't work very well um in Not somebody like who's, who's large yeah I'm, I'm so, thinking, but there's too much visceral too much. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yep, I hear you. Uh, so what I do and what I try to do, and this is something I do not just not just for this situation, but for other situations where I need, I try and put people's bodies in a place where they have no choice but to use the muscles I'm after. Mm. If I make you think that way, right? Instead of laying somebody on the back and trying to get them to feel their abdominal pull in their belly, like I, I mean, I use it, I use it all the time, right? Take a breath in, exhale. Let your belly fall inward. Give it a little bit of integrity so you can poke at your belly so you can feel, sorry, so you can feel uh, mm -hmm. the muscles contract in the abdominals, right? But you can't do that for somebody who can't poke and feel and who may not be associated right. to not have the association anymore if their tummy's been distended. Pregnant women, it's the same thing, right? After birth, it's really hard. So. I'm going to throw the question back at you guys. Um, what is something that you, a position you could put somebody in that will guarantee some abdominal work? Well, even getting off the reformer, right? If you have to get off the reformer to get up, even if you're, if you, even if you roll to your side, you still need abdominals, whether it's internal or external. So I guess, on the bar assisted, I, she just has, I'm, I know, I know, you know, she's just very breasts and like, it, you can't even get 
I don't know how to get to it. Um, but mm -hmm. so, I'd go quadruped. All four. Thank you. Yes. Really? Okay, it's just, good. That didn't occur. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just try to go with like a little cat, you know, lifting. And they may not feel like they're getting, they probably will right. think, oh, I'm not getting any work. What am I doing? But that's kind of the easier way. Because when I, I've had, um, Zana, you probably remember my friend who was um, probably, uh, she probably was 100 pounds overweight too. And putting her legs up just caused her to use her psoas, her hip flexors. Yeah. Yeah. Hip flexors. yeah. And then it strained her back because she was also, I don't know if, if Tracy is, but the, my friend is very lordotic as well. So big, big, luscious bottom or whatever that word is that um, <laughs> luscious is luxurious, <laughs> luxurious Sorry, bottom. Luxurious. <laughs> well, my my kids being half black or whatever people, there's my kids, but the lordosis in African American people is very different a lot of times. And I thought she was half black and white, but she said she's Greek or whatever. But she does. She has a very extreme lordosis, but I wouldn't really know how to tell without the luscious bottom yeah like you're saying yeah mm -hmm. yeah difficult to find it yeah yeah so uh, all fours kim can you i'm gonna ask you to elaborate since you brought it up um a little bit why does it work to put somebody on all fours to get their abdominals to work more than putting somebody on their back for example what is the one um, thing that i would say because there there isn't anything else they need to do right i mean right they don't need to hold their legs up it's gra um, gravity. Gra so gravity is going to pull them down and they're going to want to resist gravity. Yeah, exactly. Uh, so you're exactly. saying, you guys are saying, even if you have them in quadruped, in neutral, even whatever, or cat, and just have them, or neutral, and just have them try to pull their abdom, you know, sandwich in, like mm -hmm. a little giggle, they're already getting, because of the weight also on their body, they're getting mm. that work feedback. They're getting feedback from gravity. I got you. Yeah. I've been. So, yeah, that's where I would go for ab work is start okay. there. Then you mentioned Kegel. I want to I want to hit that too because we do talk a lot about how pelvic floor mm -hmm. activation assists with deep abdominal contraction. But um, so, what is a great tool? We talked about this actually last week too. A great tool to activate pelvic floor without asking somebody to activate their pelvic floor. You know. Uh, uh I, for me, I've always cued it as um, most people will, when they try to pluck up or whatever, they'll grab the, the butt, the, the, right? They grab the back body and they clinch. So for me, it's just like stopping urine mid cycle or it's, um, I don't know if there's yeah. a cue. Yeah. I make but if sure you didn't want to use words and you right. wanted to make the pelvic floor go, what could you do? Do you know, or ideas? Without words, with just putting their body in a position that activates the pelvic floor, what what could you do? I've used the cue that there's an elevator, and we're just going to draw the elevator all the way up. That's words. The... That's great. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. But those are words. Okay, okay. You could have them so, squeeze. You could have them squeeze their inner thighs. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, Beth. Hi. Nice to have you. <laughs> I, I'm kind of. I have to do something at the same time, so I'm kind of going to be going in and out. And no problem. Yes. Okay. Thank you for that. I thought it was a lecture, so I'm sorry. Oh, no problem. No problem. Mm -hmm. You're saying they have a ball, and I have to try that because I've never felt that before. I need, I, I, I like to feel before I teach it, right? So I can art. Okay. Mm -hmm. Even without words, I've never felt that. Hmm. I'll yeah. try that. Okay. Yep. Yeah. So activating inner thighs, if you want a little bit more um, internal rotation, so internal rotation of the feet even mm -hmm. or a little bit of internal rotation of the knees does help also activate it a little bit more. Okay. So um, you could use without any words, you could have them in quadruped potentially, you could have a ball in the up in the um, inner thigh area. Yeah. Okay. Or I like to I lately I've lately I've been going higher up to the inner thighs towards the pelvis, as much as I can when I use the ball, I find that I don't know, somehow that's uh, helping people a little bit more, but anywhere, right? With a little bit of adductor squeeze, uh, they can get some pelvic floor activation without any words, right? So it's just an action. Yeah. And 
if you ask somebody to squeeze the ball between their knees, they can do it usually, no matter who they are, right? So things where their body's against gravity to pull up the belly and the abdomen, inner thigh connection would be great places to start. So I, I think that's how I would go after her abs more are those two, two ways. And quadruped translates right into all different things, anything tummy down, right? Right. Uh, so you can start working. And then the other way to get abs on is to actually, I use sometimes, if they're stable enough to stand on one leg, I use a uh, kicking backwards. So hip extension, mm -hmm. a little kick back in a hip extension, zipping up the center, right? So the torso stays vertical and okay. the legs kicking backward, right? Stomach's lifted, chest torso is elevated. Yeah. So yep. that's but another way to activate glutes, but also to activate torso control uh, would be leg behind any of the hip four way can work, but the extension is the one that challenges the abdominals the most, right? Because they have to hold that torso steady. I would probably then try her um, when she gets this part, knee stretch mm -hmm. on the reformer. If she's on the reformer, and maybe not right now, but that would be my next step would be to add um, a forward facing knee stretch. Mm -hmm. uh, on the bar, you mean? You got yeah, with your hands bar. on the bar and your knees, yeah, your well, feet against the shoulder block. So you're in basically you. a quadruped. Yeah, but it's yeah, just a you little bit her, more interesting. But do you want her in this position or you want her in a plank on the and back? No, you want her this. I, and want I her want her to lift her stomach. So I'd let her go round back, especially if she's really lordotic. Like yeah, yeah, yeah. Focusing on the round back in the lumbar, not the, you know, the thoracic. Yeah. Thanks. Great. Um, should I share my case study that I prepared? Um, maybe I'll just read through it and I'm going to try to just read through it without commentating, but just start thinking about it and then we'll break it down and talk about the different pieces of it. And, and I can clarify things that don't seem very clear. And this is a client that I've been working with for, I think about a month now maybe six six weeks actually i think uh and so it's i tried to put all the layers in here it's been coming uh, coming to life in layers and so here's what we have as of today so she's a 48 year old female she came in with severe pain in the calf and knee on the left side that travels up to the hip the pain description is primarily the pain the pain she describes is primarily at the back of the knee she feels it's too painful to walk on and at first feels that the knee is unstable. So she actually came in on crutches when I first saw her. Her knee symptoms have been going on for years but got really bad after scuba diving, trying to get out of the water onto a boat. So she was unable to climb the boat's ladder after the scuba dive due to pain in the knee. Her calf pain is, is severe also at this point and it came on shortly after the knee pain started becoming more severe. So I think it was within a couple days that this calf pain happened. And that was the real, the knee was a showstopper upstairs. The calf was a showstopper for the walking. She saw a doctor, got an MRI. It cleared any mechanical issues at the knee, but she's still feeling that the knee is unstable, very unstable, in fact. So we had two sessions. They were fine. She mentions to you that she has had severe plantar fasciitis and that this is now flaring up on the same side as this knee and calf. She feels uncomfortable in tennis shoes or her, for her calf. She doesn't like orthotics that she had made years ago for the plantar fasciitis and prefers to be barefooted, but is agreeable to wearing her flip-flops with a little heel wedge to take pressure off the calf. So she starts to improve and wants to walk on the beach without shoes. She comes in for a session and in order to prep her for the beach walking, um, I did, or you do, a little more footwork and some balance exercises, as well as some ankle strengthening and add a little eccentric work for the calf as well. She comes in a week later saying that she is in more pain again and that her ankle and the arch of her foot are really hurting now. Her knee, not so much, but that the pain was really severe. And even though she walked on the beach, it was hard packed and she did not think it could have caused such a flare up. When she points at the pain, she traces the medial arch around the medial malleolus and to the back of the knee, up the medial side of the leg, up to the back of the knee. So, um, so there's one more piece of information maybe I should give you here. 
uh, she then, on this same visit in the last little paragraph, was standing and mentioned that she has pain at the ball of her big toe when she puts weight over her big toe. So if she puts the ball of the big toe down on the ground, it hurts. Um, and that she said that's been going on for years and that at some point somebody told her that she had a fat pad issue uh, under the big toe where it wasn't there wasn't enough uh, fat underneath the big toe to cushion the ball of the big toe. So this is this is where I've gotten to with her. Um, and maybe I'll give you a moment if you want to scan through it and just tell me when you're ready because um, it's a lot of information. Um, maybe just scan through it and see if you can pick out things that seem important to you and then we can talk through it step by step. Well, can I just say something, ask something? Yes, please. Yeah, please. I mean, I, I start to think that maybe it's something coming from her spine. Okay. What, uh, I don't what? know. Looking sure. at the, what? yeah. I was going to ask you, what, what leads you in that direction? Um, I think just because it's, it's always on the same side. I believe, um, from mm -hmm. and and yes. it and it and it kind of changes. So it could be if it were a nerve or something, maybe just from shifting into different positions and doing different things caused pain in different areas. Okay, That's, I like. I, mean. I like your thinking, and I I think that those are great thoughts about. The pain, it doesn't seem to be staying in the same place. It seems to be changing a bit and migrating a bit. Um, the same sidedness could be, could be coming from a nerve somewhere higher up the chain. And that's always something to put in, in your head. Mm -hmm. there, are, um, there are a couple things that maybe would make you think that that can't be it. And one is the unable to walk because of pain in the calf that she came in with initially. That one doesn't really follow that pattern so much. If it was nerve from the lumbar spine, I think what I would more expect to see there would be weakness um, or burn. the description of burning, numbness, tingling. Um, those would be more of a description. She didn't have any of those burning, numbness, tingling descriptors. And so usually if the nerve pain is coming from the back and it's all the way down the leg and foot, that would be some of the descriptors that they would use. Um, so while I think it's a very good thing to rule out, in her case, um, it doesn't seem to quite follow, but, but your thinking is not incorrect. So, um, so I, I like that you're thinking up the chain, absolutely, in this case. Well, compensation patterns so something from the hips somewhere around the the, the hip joints or that's yeah yeah where i'm going next it, it, okay and that could be the case too um the compensation pattern with gait is something that i would really look for mm -hmm. um, and so i did look for compensation pattern i did look at her walking and i didn't give you any information about that uh, unfortunately, I never saw her walk before this calf knee injury. Um, and so she couldn't walk. It was super antalgic gait when she was walking or trying to walk because she couldn't dorsiflex the foot. And maybe if I gave you that information, dorsiflexion of the foot hurt her more initially. So that means that anytime the calf went on stretch, there was more pain. And maybe that's the piece I didn't give you. So if I tell you that now, um, and you know that dorsiflexion of the ankle brings on that calf pain, that might change how you're thinking about it too. Cause now I just gave you the muscular piece to that. Yeah. So go ahead and um, what other questions do you have or what other thoughts come to mind? Was she able to stretch her calves out or? She was not initially, no, she could not. And actually even now stretching the calf is really difficult. So very painful when she goes to try and stretch the calf. 
So we did that. So this is why the wedged, um, the wedge shoes, actually, I, I recommended that she wear a heel, a shoe with a heel or shoe with a wedge. And because that keeps the calf from stretching all the way through the gait cycle, right? We keep the heel lifted. And then we actually, I actually did give her wedges to put in her tennis shoes, hoping that a tennis shoe, like I don't want her wearing flip-flops <laughs> with any of these issues. Do I really want her wearing flip-flops? Um, so I said, you know, let's put a little wedge, heel wedge in both your tennis shoes and have you try walking with that. Um, and she tried it for, I think she went for a 20 minute walk with the heel wedges in her tennis shoes. And she said her knee hurt a lot more. So we had to take the wedges out right away. And then, but then she says that her tennis shoes aren't very comfortable because her heel's too low. And so her calf hurts in the tennis shoes. So if I am, um, feel free to interrupt me and ask questions on this, but I'll just take you through kind of what um, that process was. I, she did not give me the information about the plantar fasciitis right away, which I'm sad that I didn't know that right away. Um, even though mm -hmm. I asked, you know, what else, what else? So that only came to light uh, in the last two sessions. We've been talking about the plantar fasciitis. Um, plantar fasciitis, right, remember, the plantar fascia attaches to the calcaneus from under the foot. Mm -hmm. And so the Achilles attaches to the calcaneus from above the foot. So I am always concerned about the plantar fascia when there's a calf issue. And I'm always concerned about the calf when there's a plantar fascia issue, because mm -hmm. if the calcaneus is getting pulled one way, you're going to have potentially an issue in the other in the other structures on the up other side of the calcaneus, right? So I'm always concerned with both of those. Um, so it would have been nice to know that from the get go. She, um, the knee, the knee was interesting because it really seemed like initially that knee was completely unstable. And so I actually had her get a knee brace and wear it just to see if that would help her. And that seemed to help her a lot. And what, what it looked like is, it was interesting because her knee pain that she would describe is the back of the knee. So versus being at the front of the knee um, where we would expect something like patellofemoral syndrome or um, tightness of the rectus femoris or lateral would be IT band pulling. Um, a lateral, even the patella, I thought maybe her kneecaps subluxing, uh, but there was no anterior pain. All of, all of those things have anterior pain. And the doctor apparently thought that maybe she had torn the meniscus, but that came back really clear as well. So it's, it's an interesting thing and I'm still not 100% sure, but what if, if I told you somebody had calf pain, posterior calf, and has posterior knee pain, what do you think about initially there? Gastrox. Exactly. Because it crosses you, over. They cross over. Exactly. So is there a strain or um, a tear or something there? So that's exactly what I thought at first, right? There's a strain or a tear in the gastroc. It crosses the back of the knee. Maybe this has been coming for a long time. Um, and that, that follows with the dorsiflexion of the foot, right? Not being able to dorsiflex. Mm -hmm. You can't, if, if you've got a muscle tear there, it's going to be super painful. That follows with not being able to walk through the gait cycle because you can't dorsiflex the foot enough. So I thought just that. I thought, okay, gastroc, and it's pulling at the back of her knee. And this has been a chronic issue. And it was just that extra weight of her scuba tank trying to get out of the water on a boat after floating that set it off and that the knee pain was really never me it was always gastroc and it just finally started pulling enough that it tore the muscle the next day walking on it um, i think we so might be missing one thing highly under under uh people don't look at it the popliteus so mm -hmm. pop Right. So popliteus is very tricky because it lies underneath in the knee joint and popliteus to release the popliteus. They don't always have a bump on the back of their knee. Right. It can be very tight. And when it's tight, it will the tib, the tibial, you know, it'll rotate it. Right. So I, I don't know. I think the popliteus might have something to do with this. So I thought that same thing, too. Um, <laughs> right with you. 
Okay. And um, so I'm thinking, okay, it's gastroc or popliteus. So then we did some exercises that were helping. We did the, I call it terminal knee extension, right? So we worked mm-hmm. on full, the last bit. So popliteus function is really to un, unhook the knee so you can bend it. Um, and it's going to go on stretch when you go into full extension, mm. right? So I had her work towards that last bit of extension in her knee. And that didn't bother her knee and she had control there. She had control unlocking and re-extending. So then I was mm. like, hmm, maybe it's not popliteus. So, but I, I explored that, but because that is really great thinking and I appreciate it, but I don't think it's popliteus. And, and if okay. we keep going down, and I'll tell you why I don't, like I ruled it out after the fact and I'll tell mm-hmm. you why. So she comes in then with this, plantar fasciitis Mm. um right and this is where i find out about the plantar fasciitis is after i suspect popliteus also so i find out that there's this severe it was plantar fasciitis that's now getting worse um i can't get her out of the flip-flops because that's where she wants to be or barefoot walking on the beach and she's really adamant about the fact i need to walk on the beach but i'm going to walk on the hard packed sand when can i do it when can i do it so that's why I went to that session. She was, she was actually getting much, much better. And I said, okay, let's do work, um, a little bit more work. We started doing some more eccentric uh, through the calf because she was starting to get some motion. I went eccentric from, to neutral only, not into negative, right? Just at least to get neutral range and control through neutral range at the calf. Um, and I got her on the BOSU and started working on some balance, uh, just standing on an uneven surface because I wanted her to be prepped for that. I also had been doing some ankle strengthening, inversion, eversion with a TheraBand for the ankle. And so it, I saw her Friday. She said on Saturday and Sunday, I just saw her um, today actually. And she said Saturday and Sunday, she was completely flared up. And she walked on the beach on Saturday, I believe. Um, and she was, And she's still not back to where she was before and now it's Thursday. So She's then worse. I started, she got worse. Yep. So <laughs> then I started thinking, okay, if, if she's getting worse from eccentric lowering, that's quite possible, right? If I did it too soon, um, e- even though it was just a neutral position, if I was doing too much work too soon and the muscles, the muscles actually torn in the calf, that could be what caused it. The uneven surface rate is really challenging on the ankle could be, and on the muscles all around. So maybe that could have flared it up too, I thought. And then when she came in today, she said to me, okay, my pain is, and this is where she points to the arch of her foot from under the arch of her foot on the medial side. Right here. And this is a test question for you. Yes, I I'm gonna show you. <laughs> so it's arch of the foot, medial side, wraps up the medial malleolus, in to the calf, right into that medial calf, and then follows up to the knee. Those so, are the peroneals. Those are her no, peroneals. No, peroneals. That's a good thought. Peroneals are lateral, though. Which one is I, medial? Oh, 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 I thought that, oh, they come here underneath. That, I thought the inside of the leg. Right? Yeah. The peroneal is. Come on, you know this, right? Okay. Wait, don't tell me. I got to find out or I won't feel smart. Oh. <laughs> yes, yes, go, Kim. What? Tibialis. Mm-hmm. Posterior. Yes, tibialis yeah. posterior. Right. It's. I'm looking at my anatomy app. I'm. Che- I'm cheating. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, like, it's, it's so okay. helpful. Cheating is allowed. <laughs> it's so helpful because now I'm going to look it up because I get so excited. I'm like, look at. I'm learning something. Thank you. Okay, I gotta look it up. I gotta see it. Okay, keep going. Right. I wanna I wanna hear it. So all so, of this Dana and it's their tibialis posterior. posterior. Yeah. Oh okay. okay. So I I mean I love tibialis posterior and the peroneus longus. I love their connection under the foot. Remember, those yeah. are the ones that kind of meet under the bottom of the foot. Tibialis posterior hits the arch and cr- crosses um the Peroneus longus goes under that fifth metatarsal, right? And so they create this little sling right under the arch of the foot. 
Right. Okay, so right. if her, she's having plantar fasciitis, if she has her arch falling into that tendon, it's very common that that tibialis posterior can get inflamed and irritated. And she drew its pathway up her leg to the back of her knee. So today I was like, here we are. We finally figured this thing out, right? So Kim, you were thinking, your thinking was great, right? You're thinking um, up to down. This isn't, you're thinking, this isn't just a knee or an ankle separate. You were really trying to connect the dots and that, that's exactly the right thinking. And ruling out the back is really important. Erin thinking about popliteus and trying to rule out, is, could it be? Because I think I thought I had the same thought. Mm -hmm. Do I, I need to rule that out as well? But then when this plantar fasciitis, that's why I said, I wish I had known that plantar fasciitis piece in the beginning because that would have maybe helped me get there a lot sooner, you know, after two visits instead of after four visits or, um, and just realize. So if we're thinking now, if you th start thinking tibialis posterior, causing pain, foot, ankle, and posterior knee, what do we start doing with this person? Good right. question. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, real quick. I know we don't have a, before you go though. So you, uh, so she was very pronated then. She's She'd be pronating. pronating. She which is pronating, be, which would be affecting that the posterior mm -hmm. tibialis, right? I got yes. you. Oh, it's, I understand. Um, so I let me add, add one other thing here. Sorry, let me add one other yeah. thing. The um, pain at the base of the first metatarsal. I have to say that I don't know, sorry, I don't know what's happening here. Um, I don't know what, um, okay, can't, sorry, can you guys? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, can you hear can hear me? Okay, yeah, you don't fine. have loud. See you um, and hear you. Okay, perfect, sorry. I had a moment of something going on here. Um, so the, the pain at the ball of the big toe um, is, it's something that I think I still am figuring out. It, for me, it can be one of three things, right? We said it could be also from the plantar fasciitis, but I don't think so. When I had her stand, she could not keep weight across the balls of all her toes. I was trying to get her to stand on and just take a look. She always wants to evert to some extent. Yeah. So we need to, I was trying to get her down onto the ball of the big toe. Um, and she said, it's always been painful for me to do that. And somebody told me, and I said, well, okay, if that's the case, there's three things that come to mind, right? Rem remember under the ball of the first met, we have the sesamoid bones. You guys remember the little sesamoid bones. So the uh, only sesamoid bones in the body are those two and the ones at the patella, the patella being the biggest one. Um, and so sometimes if there's a fracturing of one of them, or displacement of one of those sesamoid bones, they, it can be really painful to put weight off for the ball of the foot. So that was one. The other could be a bunion. Now she doesn't have the bunion, typical bunion where her, she's sticking out with a metatrice is going growth outward, but it could potentially be that there is going downward, um, some bony overgrowth, or it could be osteoarthritis at that joint that's preventing her from wanting to bend at that joint. Uh, and then the other thing I said is it could be a fat pad issue. And she said, oh, somebody mentioned that years ago. So I'm not sure hundred percent how that connects yet. Although not putting weight on the ball of the big toe and everting away and then collapsing in the arch, she's starting to get this picture of what her foot's doing and how that could affect her all the way up the chain right um, on that medial side of her foot, right? That's all, it's all mechanically not correct. So, um, so that was the other piece here. So yeah, okay, what do we do with her? I'm gonna, I'm always honest. I feel like I got the whole spine, shoulders and that. That's, but boy, I'll tell you what, the hands and the feet, that's where I think, the anatomy gets so crazy, you know what I mean? Um, so I, I, I've, I'm looking forward to the foot part of this. So <laughs> we look at the antagonist then to um, the posterior tip, would we think about the antagonist or no? 
Um, we could. Yeah. But we that could. wouldn't. Be we want to. Okay. So if right, yeah. If there's a tendonitis in any place, what is your primary concern? So let's call it a tendonitis. Because we, I don't know, I don't know the extent of the damage. The, the interesting thing was the doctor was so focused on the knee that he didn't even look at the foot or the ankle. There's been no attention to the foot or the ankle so far. So I did tell her, maybe we want you to see a podiatrist. <laughs> I did say that. Um, and she is going back to check in with the orthopedist and I, and I have already spoken to him earlier on. I'm going to talk to him again and just say, maybe we need a podiatrist in the mix here. But so um I'm sorry. Now I'm, I say I'm really excited. I should have been the PT rounds longer because I get to ask you these things. So, would you say in your mind that it maybe what it was maybe never a knee problem because we look at the body from get up, right? So it was always this foot issue, right? This tip posterior tibialis, Nothing. whatever she's been doing to try to, you know, not be in pain. Which I want to know what yes. and what you think, yeah. like because. The knee wasn't yeah. maybe part of the real problem. Her knee's not. I don't think her knee's the problem. Okay. And we have an MRI that says it's not, which is what, probably I, close okay. close to. I mean, maybe not 100 percent accurate, but close. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Got I it. think the problem. I think the problem started from her big toe. And maybe you could take it back further and say it's her foot mechanics initially, without having enough support under the arch that started the weight over the ball of the foot in the wrong place. And then the plantar fasciitis, I mean, but I really think that all of this actually has to do with her foot. So, so it did, you, did you ever roll okay. her foot with a, like, is it too painful for her to roll her foot on a ball? I mean, did that cause her pain, that kind of thing or the footwork? Yeah. Good question. I, um, she doesn't like to put any weight on the ball of the foot. I did have her start with, with a squishy ball, actually, the toe gripping and the toe doming over the squishy ball that she could tolerate, but she mm. has no, um, she didn't have any, she couldn't do the doming. She can hardly curl her toes. So she's really stiff and immobile mm. in, in the foot, um, especially in that mid to forefoot. Um, wow. There's really not a lot of articulation. Um, and so, and I haven't tried a harder ball underneath to see what happens if we were to break up the fascia that way. Uh, I haven't tried that yet. I thought, I thought and maybe to, today I was really more concerned with not aggravating her uh, because she had more aggravation from a week yeah. ago. Um, yeah. But that is something I told her to, to do the frozen bottle to freeze a plastic bottle mm, yeah. and, and roll that under her foot to her tolerance just to try and, and calm it down. Um, but I think, and I did tell her that I, I think we need to get out of the flip flops. <laughs> I'm yeah. really trying to get her into something that's going to support that calcaneus and then support her forefoot a little bit so we can calm down the plantar fasciitis. Um, but I haven't convinced her of that just yet. But if so, she sees a podiatrist, that might take care of it. That might take care of it, which is why I'm kind of pushing in that direction rather than, and I did tape her foot today. Um, we used a foot tape uh, and did a, a nice little arch support tape for her. Uh, and she felt relief from that pretty quickly. So I said, at least if she's going to be in flip flops, we've got some support under that foot yeah. um, for now. Or but maybe just to wear very... the tape for a while, you know, till, mm -hmm. yeah. till she can get more uh, strength and opening. So, she... you know, I think um, I love all those ideas. I, I think what my next step is, so what I left her with homework wise were two things in particular. Mm. One was the ball, the soft ball, toes curling and doming over the ball. Mm. The second was inversion with a TheraBand, ankle inversion with a TheraBand. So um, that is the one where you're yeah. putting it, the strap around both feet, crossing over and going inward with the ankle because that's exactly the action or one of the actions of the tibialis posterior. And interestingly, it was a test and also I think a necessary strengthening work. I wanted to see what would happen if I, if I had her do inversion and she's like, oh yeah, that's exactly what I feel coming up uh, my leg. And I said, okay, so we need to strengthen that, but we need to do it in small ways. So you're going to do 10, that's it a day. And let's just see how that feels. If it feels too much, you do less. If it feels good, um, you'll, you can start doing more, but it should start to feel good if she's working it just gently like that with a TheraBand so, um, in isolation. 
I'm sorry. <laughs> good, good. You're telling her this, this? Nope. Nope. Other way. Inversion. Other way. Yep. That way. Well, I, if standing, I think of it, I think of it as supination and pronation, but if you're not standing inversion yeah. and it's not, I'm not talking about the foot. I'm talking about the ankle. So it would be inversion oh, at the ankle. I'm, I apologize. I got you. Okay. That's okay. Yep. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. Okay. So, um, slightly resisted inversion. Yeah. Okay. So those are the things, and she's not great at her home program. This is the other really hard thing um, is that she wants to come in and do Pilates, which is great. So we can get her doing that. I just need to feel like I want to sort this out a little bit more <laughs> before she just comes in and does Pilates because uh, I was surprised at how flared up she was after Friday. And it could be that it wasn't just the Pilates session. It could be accumulation. She started to feel better. She started to do a lot more, a lot more. Um, but it concerned me that what we did could have flared her up. Yeah, uh, I thought maybe the Bo Bosu maybe is what did it. Um, yeah. or maybe the eccentric to neutral was too much. Um, but if that's too much, then she's really not functional yet and should be, uh, needs to be really monitored. So, um, so that's yeah, why uh, that's, it's, it's, it's so, sorry, but like, like, how do you persuade someone like what would be more beneficial for at this point would be to do the sessions with you, but in between is to be taped for a little while. And to do, you know, whether it's getting the, the ball briefly and then just some exercises briefly for literally five minutes a day and just persuading her because it's such an uphill battle without mm -hmm. having a little bit of that on her own and mm -hmm. seeing kind of more of a daily thing and just attending to it and what, see what, you know, whatever makes her feel good, whether it's not the ball rolling, you know, getting in a hot you know, water and moving the, you know, mm. or icing, what does she need to do? Like keep, I mean, I know I would keep just trying to persuade her to do a little bit on her own. Like she could do the heat and then she could do the ice rolling, you know, with the bottle. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think she's convinced to do a little bit because she, and she says, I know I should, I know I should. I'm like, well, what point do you actually do? <laughs> they do all it. say that. What? They I all know. say that. I know. <laughs> But yes, sometimes I wish I had been a psychologist. I could bring in a psychologist to go, here, look, we're going to convince you. Here's how we convince you. <laughs> but yes, I think, um, but I, why, why I wanted to present this case is because I felt like it's so interesting um, to see how it developed, to mm. see where it started, which was complaint of knee pain and calf pain. And she was so in pain and so fearful of that pain. She told me that the doctor said she wasn't allowed to put any weight on her leg when she came in. And I thought, if this is just a calf strain, we should be progressing you towards weight bearing, not have you on crutches. She said she needed to be in crutches for six weeks. And I thought that can't be right unless there's like a really bad thing that I don't know about, which is what prompted me to talk to the doctor in the first place. Uh, and he, he said, no, she should be progressively weight bearing. Uh, and the knee's fine. So it was yeah. just interesting, though, that posterior knee pain and then trying to put all these pieces together. Sometimes we just get broken information and it's like a puzzle trying to put it all together. But um, hopefully she, she'll, the taping will help her and she'll see that this all has a lot to do with her foot. And then maybe that will motivate her to also see the podiatrist. And then maybe it'll, that will convince her to get out of those flip flops and actually put on some supportive shoes that can help the plantar fasciitis in the bottom of her foot. And then hopefully we move in the right direction. Well, but, I, um, I always tell people pain is a wonderful motivator. You well, thank you guys. I don't want to keep you too late. So I know you guys all have things to do. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here. I really appreciate it. And then I will look for you guys next week.